Dr. Mike Lenore, and this is The Wellness Watch. All right, good health and welcome to today's edition of Black Doctor Speak, the podcast and the African American Wellness Project's Wellness Watch. Our special guest, uh, as always, when we can grab her, is Dr. Noah Abliana. <laughs> um, uh, good health and welcome to today's edition of the Wellness Watch and the Black Doctor Speak podcast sponsored by the African American Wellness Project and blackdoctors.org. Our special guest is Dr. Noah Abliana. She is our guest host on a number of occasions whenever we can grab her from the busy work of running the Very Fine Roots Community Clinic here in Oakland, California. Welcome to our program. Thank you for having me. Polio. Polio. You remember, you remember when Alan Iverson said practice? They were complaining about it. He said practice. I'm saying polio. Polio is back. What do you think? I mean, this is one of the most depressing things, you know, when you think about this was sort of like one of the successes of public health, right? It's like we almost eradicated polio. We pretty much eradicated it from the United States. And there was only two endemic countries left, uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. So to hear of any sort of a resurgence in this country is... Uh, kind of sad, um, especially when we're already dealing with, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic and then now the monkeypox uh, outbreak. Uh, and so now to hear about polio, which is something that I think we all thought was like in the rear view mirror, um, it's, it's pretty disheartening, I got to say. You know, where, where have these things been? Like monkeypox, it didn't just show up in the United States. It's been somewhere. Uh, yes. Where has it been? What is it doing and why is it now more across the world? So, I mean, MPX appears to have mutated a fair bit um, now. And the, the strain that is causing sustained human-to-human -human transmission and where we have multiple chains of human-to-human -human transmission is a little different than the one that has been endemic in Africa for some time. And I do think it's worth saying that African scientists have been raising a flag on this for a while. And unfortunately, you know, the, the so-called Western world has not paid attention. And now we're paying attention because now it has, you know, it has definitely mutated and it's spread. And now we are racing to try to contain it. Well, you know, uh, the, uh, in the situation with polio is very much the same. You know, the vaccines that we're getting, we're stealing from the rest of the world. Uh, polio, you know, we, in, we uh, developed an an injection for it um, many years ago, 1955, I think. Uh, but the rest of the world didn't have that same uh, treatment. They were using the live virus. And the live virus sometimes spills over and infects other people. So it's been kind of hanging around. Uh, and, and what people are not realizing is that we, we get all these vaccines, but the rest of the world doesn't. And as long as these things, uh, it's a partnership, uh, you know, here, um, they're not healthy. Uh, and it's still kind of hanging around these places. Eventually, uh, it gets to us in one form or the other. Uh, and so I think that that's we're short-sighted as we try to start to kind of grind out all of the vaccines for things like monkeypox, uh, MPX, as uh, I guess it's now uh, more scientifically called. I'm still calling it monkeypox. But, I'm trying to call it MPX. It just well, makes it easier to cope. You know why they want to call it MPX? Because of the population that it impacts. I mean, I just think that uh, they didn't, they don't hesitate to, to change the name of other disease. They don't change the name of other diseases. And I think that this is a, it's, the, it's an irrelevant issue, but I am, it is interesting that they wanted the name of it changed after all of these years of calling it monkeypox all over the continent uh, of Africa. Uh, and so we have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, the more vaccine we have, the less vaccine sometimes is in the rest of the world. Uh, and so I think that's a, that's just one of the things. Uh, the big deal on monkeypox is that the vaccine is 100% effective, uh, and it really doesn't cause the kind of diseases that we're talking about when we're talking about COVID. So let's ease on into COVID and talk about uh, the uh, new vaccines, uh, or at least the new booster. It's coming out in the fall. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, well, we have a couple of exciting things going on, I think, with COVID and vaccines. One is that Novavax is now available 
So for people who really were not comfortable with the newer technology, the mRNA technology, the Novavax is a protein subunit vaccine. So it's like some of our flu vaccines. So some folks um, have actually been waiting for this. They've been waiting for something that wasn't the mRNA uh, for whatever their individual reasons might be. And so now that is available. So we're really wanting to get the word out about that. And so maybe folks who might have hesitated on the mRNA may want to take up the Novavax. And then the other piece of news is that in the fall, we're anticipating the bivalent vaccine, which some people are just calling like the Omicron booster, um, which is basically a little more tuned towards the variants. And so that will be forthcoming. And I think we'll just need to see what the supply looks like, what the recommendations are going to look like. Is it going to be a certain uh, age groups or is it going to be for everyone? And so I think some of that still remains to be seen. Some of the interesting questions are, um, if you haven't been vaccinated, do you just go get this one? Or do you have to go through the whole process of catching up uh, to get to this one so that that one, so that it's more effective? Uh, what about so this one is going to have the old variety and the new variety in it. And so you, you won't need to get the old ones. Um, but I think that, that it still is a question. If you haven't gotten any yet, would you get three of these? And that, I, I think that's probably what it's going to be. You're going to still need a three dose series, but it will be with this newer version because this newer version is, is you know, it's going to be more updated um, to the variants that are circulating now. And hopefully we won't be behind. Hopefully when the winter surge comes, we wouldn't have yet another variant and need yet another vaccine. But I mean, the fact is we don't know yet because last year, uh, you know, we weren't expecting the Omicron surge to happen, um, you know, around Thanksgiving, but that that's what happened. Yeah, well, I think that uh, that here again, there's a lot of unknowns in these vaccines. I mean, I, I, I tend to get the vaccine early, so I assume that much of my immune immunity toward uh, COVID was waning until I got COVID, which gave, gives me another 90-day window. Um, I think we're still looking at the difficulty in getting people to get that third booster, and we're looking at the impossible task of trying to get children vaccinated. Uh, I think one of the things that bothers me most about the arrangement of polio also is that that suggests that a lot of people are not getting regular vaccines. And in parts of the country where African-Americans are less vaccinated than others, I think we're going to start to see some of these childhood um, diseases uh, uh, increase. What say you about that? Yeah, I mean, this is a, it's sort of like I said, it's kind of a sad day, I think, in terms of um, both both for public health, but also for those of us who are in healthcare delivery, where, um, you know, these are modern inventions, like we don't want to go to a back to like a pre vaccine era. I mean, that would just be like, we would have to be beyond foolish, honestly, to end ourselves up back in a situation where our children are getting vaccine preventable, uh, you know, illnesses. Um, and polio is not a joke. I mean, this is causing paralysis for life. You know, there's a 20 year old in New York now who was paralyzed for life with polio. Um, and so we would be downright foolish to allow this thing to take hold again. And really, the only the only folks that are going to be at risk are those who are unvaccinated and perhaps some who are under vaccinated. Um, so I think I think it's it's a sad situation. I think the situation with COVID-19 is also going to be sad because some children do have bad outcomes. And if you have a child with a bad outcome because they were not vaccinated, that is a shameful uh, state of affairs. Well, you've made the point, and I think it's a point that I reiterate every time I can. Uh, I'm not satisfied that uh, even though a small number of children die, we're willing to accept that as the cost of going back to doing business as usual, 4,500 people a day. I just think that that's a disgraceful position for a, quote, civilized nation to be in is that we are willing to accept that number of deaths in order to go back to doing business. And I think that's a point well taken. And I think that's a point that people are going to have to start uh, to consider. Uh, so I think that's one thing. Uh, another I thing that- wanna say, I, I do wanna say something about that. We're at four to 500 deaths a day now. We're not in a fall surge, we're not in a winter surge. And, and that is about double where we were um, last summer. So last June and July, we had about two to 300 deaths per day. And this is before we even had Paxlovid. So mm -hmm. I think we need to really, uh, like, we need a little reality check around this. We're not doing that great just because people are, you know, dropping the mitigations. Um, it's not because we're doing particularly well. And I do worry about what we're setting up in terms of what's coming for the fall and the winter. 
if we're not masking in schools, we're not, you know, we're not basically doing any mitigations. Um, and we, and this thing continues to mutate. Well, we're talking with Dr. Nora Avalada. We're talking about the COVID vaccine. We're talking about resurgence of polio. Uh, we're going to take a break now. And when we come back, we're going to talk about getting your children's health care system ready for school. I'm Dr. Michael Nor with the health tip of the day. Well, if you're wheezing and sneezing, it's allergy season all across the country. This is a good time to avoid those things that you know trigger your allergies. Stock up on non-sedating antihistamines and nasal sprays. And if this happens to you every year and you're pretty miserable, it just might be a good time to see an allergist. For more information, go to our website at aawellnessproject.org. So, Dr. Lenore, I know you're a pediatrician and school's back in session now. And I also know that during the pandemic, a lot of parents kind of held off on some routine things for their young people. So how do they send kids back to school and feeling good about where they are with their health? Well, you know, I think that there are a number of steps that people can take. Obviously, there are more steps than I'm going to be able to mention. But uh, I think people need to build their own health care system before the children go to school. Uh, first of all, they need to teach them good eating habits before they start school. I mean, I always say a child can't drive to McDonald's, but you see McDonald's full of children. And so I think if you expect your children to eat well at school when they're away from you, you need to teach them to eat well at home and what and how to make good food choices. So I think that that's one thing. I think the thing, second thing you need to do is get teach them good sleep habits because a, a student is more efficient when they've had a good night's sleep. And some of these kids are up to one and two o'clock playing video games, doing things. And so I think that all that has to be done before they start school. Don't expect to be able to make these huge changes uh, in your children's diet or in your children's exercise programs uh, after, they, um, after they start school if you haven't done anything at home before. So be proactive about diet, exercise, and sleep. I think the second thing is you better organize a healthcare system. That means you need to to select a, a doctor. I mean, a lot of you have good doctors you, and you should keep them. But if you want, if you need to change them for convenience, either because they don't have the experience or because they're not near you, you know, or because they are, they don't listen to you or, or talk to you or they're not easy to get a hold of, you should make that change. I mean, most doctors who have been with you a long time will understand if you have good reasons for making a change. So you, selecting a, a, a doctor to care for your children, like a, who's experienced, who uh, who's listens to you, who's easy to get a hold of, and who's somewhere near where you live, I think makes a big difference if you're trying to get health care uh, for children uh, during the school year. And I think probably the, the third thing is that we, you have to get some things done yourself. Uh, you should take a CPR course. You should always have that. Um, you, you should always have... Uh, action act plans for children with chronic diseases like asthma or diabetes or any one of the a number of immune deficiency issues um, that your children can have. You need to have uh, asthma action plans. You need to know poison control number and you need to know what your insurance covers. I mean, a lot of times people are surprised when they show up with children uh, in the emergency room and then the bill shows up and you realize that your insurance wanted you to go to a different hospital or get a different set uh, of, um, of uh, treatments. So uh, that's that's another thing. And you need to know which hospitals really can care for children. You don't want to take a sick child into a hospital that takes care of children on a part-time basis. Mm -hmm. Here in the Bay Area, we have a unique situation in that we have one children's hospital that cares for emergencies with children. Uh, and it's a very fine children's hospital. The UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital just used to be known as children's. Uh, and so consequently, uh, those are the things that I think are important. Certainly be proactive. Uh, and secondly, choose a healthcare system that you can deal with and, and providers that you can work with. And finally, do some things yourself about getting prepared uh, by, like I say, taking CPR courses and, and knowing what your insurance covers, uh, knowing where to go when your children are sick. I think if you do all of that before the school year starts, I think when a crisis comes up, it will save you an immense amount of time and improve the quality of care for your children. Um, and so let's move back to something that I uh, had a chance to read about uh, recently. Uh, and it's this whole issue of vaccine hesitancy. I don't want to talk about it in terms of why we aren't getting people vaccinated. 
But it was an interesting um, uh, analysis in a public health journal about why people are hesitant to get vaccines. And I think there are two sides of it. The one side is that they just don't trust the people telling them to get the vaccine. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not about Tuskegee anymore, at, at least it's some of the studies suggest. African-Americans don't want to get um, the vaccine. They don't trust the people right now. They're not talking about Tuskegee. They're talking about the people they encounter every day on their jobs and in the hospital systems and the way that they're treated so that they're not responding uh, to the Tuskegee studies. They're responding to the suspicions that they have about the healthcare system that they encounter now. The second thing it seems is that if you're concerned about your community, you're more likely to have um, to get vaccinated or, or to take steps that the public health community asks you to take. Uh, I think we're we're losing our sense of community. I don't think there's any question about that. It used to revolve around churches and spirituality and religion, but you know now young people are drifting off in all kinds of different ways. And so there's a breakdown in our communities, and that means there's a breakdown uh, in people willing to sacrifice uh, for the community. And the one thing that seems to work, at least to tie all this together and be more effective, is empathy for the position of the person who is not getting the vaccine, because some of them see themselves as, uh, you know, as, um, uh, you know, patriots. You know, they're fighting the system, and it's part of their usual, and they've been fighting the system a lot of other ways, sometimes right, sometimes wrong, but they see not getting vaccinated as a way to fight the system. Uh, so empathy seems to be uh, one of the key components. Uh, what have you thought about hesitancy? And do you have some theories about why uh, it's so difficult uh, to achieve? Yeah, this situation that we've gotten into with this pandemic, I think has been really unique and, uh, you know, kind of disheartening, I guess, where it's gotten very political. And I think that's that's a big problem because you've had um, so many campaigns of disinformation and misinformation. Um, and I think in some ways, um, in some ways we've lost our way a bit and lost our ability to really anchor to facts and to uh, the truth. And I think um, healthcare itself has earned a lot of the distrust and hasn't been able to be transparent. And that is part of the problem. And I do think that if more people actually had like a primary care doctor that they trust, you know, like you, Dr. Lenore, where they've been going to you, you know, their family knows you, um, they know that you're not going to steer them wrong. They're a lot more likely to listen to you as the primary care doctor uh, than just somebody on TV. Or, you know, if you go on social media, you can find just as many people who think is good or think is bad. And, and people are starting to think that that all opinions are created equal when that's obviously not the case. We have people with decades of expertise and experience in different areas, and it can be a lot for people to sort through. And so I feel like part of what happened early on was like information overload, where it was just too much for people to process. So they just went with, you know, what they were feeling. And we all felt scared. I mean, I don't know about you, but I felt nervous, you know, going, this has got a new disease. We got a new, a vaccine for a new disease. And so like, none of this was really easy. I mean, we all had to do our homework and get ourselves comfortable with what it is we needed to do to protect ourselves in the best way possible. So it's not to say it's easy. And I think you're right in the sense that some people who have decided not to get it, um, maybe, you know, maybe at first some of them were feeling like they were really doing something, you know, they were going against the system, um, you know, and, and I, I get that tendency emotionally, but we got to be smart and we got to use the intelligence that we have because we have a lot of brilliance and we need to lean in on people who have spent their lives, you know, in virology, epidemiology, medicine, etc. Um, and figure out who it is uh, that we can trust. And we only need, you know, a couple people, maybe one person who you know would not steer you wrong and who has the information. Um, and I think that would go a long way. And unfortunately, a lot of folks really don't have that relationship with the primary care doctor. So I actually personally do feel like um, that is a big component of is not having that relation, that trusting relationship with the primary care doctor that you can trust. Because you're right, not many of us wanted to go to some big government site uh, some FEMA operated site to go get our vaccine. We would be much more comfortable going into our own doctor to get the advice. 
And frankly, that's the position we're in now is people are going to have to go to their own doctor to get anything with COVID. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to, it's not that, it's just kind of like if your patient smokes, you know, I don't just say, oh, they don't want, they don't want to quit. I'm not going to talk to them about it. No, I'm going to talk about it every single time I talk to them. And so it's the same thing with the COVID vaccine. If you feel like you have a patient who needs to get the vaccine and they haven't gotten it yet, it's really incumbent upon us to remind them, you know, that this is safe. Uh, there's been, you know, millions upon millions of doses given safely um, and that this is the best way to keep them from being a statistic. Um, like we just got done saying 400 to 500 people per day still dying of this thing. Um, many of them are unvaccinated, you know, 11 times more are unvaccinated. And so that, you know, those numbers don't lie. Well, you know, one of the things that uh, always intrigues me is the fact that, you know, people are always trying to reach black people. I mean, uh, obviously, the social determinants of health become kind of a big thing and reaching out to the black community and changing health equity issues. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I don't know why they think that because the American Heart Association tells you that you should do this, that black people are listen to them or, or that, you know, someone someone tells you that there's something different about the pulse, uh, uh, you know, your pulse uh, oximetry and you need to redo something like that or uh, you, you need to do certain take certain steps uh, to prevent prostate cancer, and, and then they have a uh, they have kind of a generic um, um, person telling you uh, to do these things. People you've never seen or heard, not from your community, expect people to pay any attention to that at all. I mean, I, it always amazes me how much money is spent in trying to message to the black community without reaching out to the people who can really deliver the message. Well, I think part of this goes to, you know, that that really there has to be some pretty deep work to kind of dismantle and undo all the structures that have led us to the situation we're in today. So I think people see it for what it is. It's like it's almost like too little, too late. Um, you want to tell me that you have accepted for decades a device of the pulse oximeter that doesn't work in people with melanin in their skin, and now I'm supposed to do something about that? Like, that was negligence for decades. That's what you, you all should be doing. So I think people see through it and see it for what it is. I think the challenge that we have, though, is that doesn't mean you don't take advantage of some of the best advances, you know, that modern medicine has to offer and become a statistic and die because you were pissed off because of systemic racism. It's a fact. Um, and I think there's a lot of work to be done to overcome it. Uh, but I think, you know, folks are smart and they can see when it's just a, it's just a gesture that's coming too little too late because you want to be able to check a box and said you did some equity work over here. When what you really need to do is dig deep and understand why was this even allowed to happen in the first place and how do we fix that? You know, you know I think that you're actually right about that. Uh, I think that it's just uh, unbelievable how much money is put spent in trying to message to people without using the people who could actually effectively deliver the message. Uh, one of the things that we talked about early on in our podcast was your uh, the Roots Community Clinic always has some innovative ways to approach things. Uh, and you had uh, developed a program that tries to deal with the tremendous problems with mental health in your communities. Tell us a little bit about summarize, summary of some of that program and how's it working? Yeah, I mean, I think with Roots in general, our our approach has always been to really listen to folks from the community, hire folks from the community. Um, we really are the community. And so it makes it a lot more seamless. We're not like sitting in some office trying to be like, hmm, what do we think this community will respond to? Because the folks that are developing and designing are, are of the community and are in constant, you know, constant communication about what's working and what isn't working. And so with behavioral health and community violence, we really were just experiencing a tremendous amount of need and really have advanced several different solutions around that. And it's not just hiring more behavioral providers, although we have had to definitely do that. Um, and again, our behavioral providers are of the community, look like the community, understand what the barriers and the challenges are. But we've also increased um, our navigators who are community health workers. They've all been getting training on community, community mental health, how to identify folks in crisis, how to de-escalate situations, um, basically how to recognize triggers and so on. And so we've really been trying to do quite a bit of training across our staff to help because it's almost like we need all hands on deck. 
We also know that we need family members, we need community members, we need teachers, we need really everyone um, to be, you know, I think trained and knowledgeable about how to recognize when someone might be in trouble so that we can all respond. And it could be something as simple as just checking on each other um, or just remembering that just because you say, how are you? And they say, I'm fine. Are they really, you know, are we really, um, are we really, really checking in on, on each other? And so I think we, you know, we've also um, are in the process of developing a campaign around that um, just so that we can all be in tune. Because we are in a moment where I think people are starting to talk about mental health a little bit more. And we want to make sure that nobody is getting left behind in that. Um, the other thing we've done is we have um, purchased a community center and just a place for basically people to be able to come and us to have multi-generational type of events and engagement and things like that. Because one of the things that we noticed during the pandemic is with all the isolation and we have isolation and people not having places to gather. But then at the same time, we have all of these assets within the community that really are not being used properly or that are not necessarily safe. So we've been partnering with the city to try to make sure that we have parks that are safe and places for people to be able to gather because isolation, I think, is a big part of what is leading to, you know, a lot of the mental health challenges, especially amongst our elders. So we're, we're kind of looking at it all the way across the board from our young people who may not have, you know, a lot of hope and opportunity about the future um, and who are engaged in gang and gun violence. We are working deeply with them and presenting more hope and opportunity for them through our workforce training and wraparound supports um, all the way through to our elders who, you know, at the certainly through the pandemic, we're the most at risk and the most isolated. And we want to make sure that they're continuing to have connections, social connections and so on. So it's definitely a work in progress and something we just continue building and building and building. You know, one of the paradoxes that we see is that, you know, sometimes we talk about the safety net and the health system. But I can tell you, it's easier for me to get services uh, for people who are on uh, Medicaid and, and who uh, and insurances that are, are funded by the state and federal government than it is for me to get services for middle class patients who are work, and working people uh, because often their insurances don't cover uh, adequate mental health and we're going to have to really figure out how to make that happen because it is so important uh, that we do something about the mental health of the whole community. So, well, we've covered quite a few things today. I, I hope that uh, people appreciate the uh, uh, wisdom that you bring and the information that you give us. Um, we want to thank Dr. Avalada uh, for her um, involvement. We talked about COVID. We've talked about polio. Talked about going back to school. Uh, we've talked about mental health, uh, and we've talked about several other things as well. So, we want you to join us each week on the Wellness Watch, the uh, Facebook Live program on the Black Doctor Speak podcast, uh, and many of these weeks when Dr. Avalada can spare her time. Uh, she'll be uh, with us as our guest host. So remember, as we always say, health is your biggest asset. So protect it. Uh, and remember our podcast, Black Doctors Speak, uh, on any podcast channel. Uh, and Wellness Watch, you, you'll find on blackdoctor.org uh, and on our own African American Wellness Project at aawellnessproject.org. So thank you, Dr. Abalana, and we'll talk to you again next time. Thank you. Thank you.